Next we'll call Zweiker versus Lake Superior State University. This is a mini oral argument on the application uh, with a 30 minute argument per side. Morning. You have your, your clock is. We broken. are aware. We're, we're having that taken care of. Uh, you have uh, two right, minutes. Right, twice a day, Council. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have uh, two minutes of a free fire zone, uh, which you may waive. Um, and then, if you're going to ask uh, for rebuttal, we ask that you just keep track of your time on your own. I think I think we should be good because you've got 30 minutes. So. Uh, thank you. May it please the court. Uh, I would like to reserve 10 minutes for rebuttal, and I'll try to keep track of my time. Uh, David Fink, appearing on behalf of students at Eastern Michigan University, Central Michigan University, Lake Superior State University. And as the court may be aware, there are six more of these cases pending in the lower courts regarding six other universities in the state. So in total, the decision that the court makes today, or that the court ultimately makes in this case, if it does grant our application for leave, will affect more than 200,000 college students in the state of Michigan. As the court knows, the Court of Appeals relied on three short financial responsibility documents that are essentially promissory notes. In coming to its conclusion that the students are unable to receive any reimbursement at all for services that the universities were unable to provide due to COVID. So let's talk about the actual documents and what they say. The Eastern Michigan document, the Lake Superior State document, both say when I register for any class or receive any service, not and, when I register or receive any service, I accept full responsibility to pay all tuition fees and other associated costs. The central Michigan document simply says by completing registration at central Michigan, you agree to financial responsibility. The Court of Appeals interpreted each of these documents not as the promissory notes that they were, but rather as documents controlling the entire relationship between the parties, between the universities and the students. And as such, found that the universities, once the student was allowed to register, had absolutely no further responsibility to the students. As Judge Swartzel so accurately said in his dissent, students are paying for education. They're paying for school activities. They're not paying for registration. And so these purported contracts really have no consideration at all from the universities. In the absence of mutuality of consideration, there is no contract. So either the court should find that there is a broader contract implied in fact, and there's plenty of places to find that, or if there is no contract at all, then our claims for unjust enrichment properly pled should survive. Now, to be clear, we are not saying in any of these cases that the universities did something wrong by not providing the services. We're not seeking an injunction to force the universities to go back and provide any of these services. What we're saying is the students should not have to pay for what they did not receive. 
Same argument, same issue with room and board. Slightly different contractual situation, but the exact same issue. In what landlord-tenant context can any of us imagine in which the landlord is unable to provide a safe residence, and so the tenancy is terminated, but the tenant still has to pay, which is what happened here? In what situation is a restaurant unable to provide a meal, but the patron still has to pay, which well, is Scott, what happened let me, here? Let me just get, get a little more specific to your, to your case, to these cases and your claims. The, um, each of these universities, I imagine, has a course catalog, probably an online course catalog. Is that right? That's correct. They had course catalogs. There was online information and, of course, plenty of other information about what the students anticipated, what they expected to get. Well, when, they're when a student is registering, aren't they selecting classes from the course catalog? Absolutely. And, and they receive a schedule, and the schedule tells them what class they're going to and what professor is going to be teaching in that class. Absolutely. Does the course catalog make it clear whether the course is going to be offered in person or online? Yes. The, the course catalogs, and to be clear, I, I want to draw one important distinction here. Some of the schools do offer an alternative, which is online education. And absolutely, some students select that. This isn't what happened here. What happened here was something we refer to as emergency remote teaching. When the schools could not provide Professor Viviano to speak to the class, instead, they asked him to put together an, a, a very quick program so that they could do something uh, remotely. And they did. They did the best job they could. The issue isn't whether the universities did what they could, but whether the students got what they paid for. But when you, when you uh, talk about the relationship between the student and the university, and whether it's wholly governed by the tuition agreement, which you've referred to as a promissory note, um, it seems to me, as I understand your argument, I, and if I'm characterizing it wrong, I want you to tell me, your view is that the students, I mean, say I decided I wanted to purchase a new set of golf clubs, and so I looked at the sporting goods catalog, and I selected uh, golf clubs from a certain manufacturer, and I agreed to pay for those, and, and my, my agreement to pay is, is, is tied to the company's uh, agreement to provide the services that are, or the product in that case, listed in the catalog. Isn't that what your claim essentially comes down to? Well, well, see, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. But here's what happened here. They added an integration clause to the order form that the court completed. And when you ordered those Callaway golf clubs, at the bottom it said, uh, that it had an integration clause that said upon ordering these golf clubs you owe us the full amount. And then they sent you another note saying, sorry, we don't have those golf clubs, but we're going to keep your money. As crazy as it sounds... Or, or perhaps they said instead of Callaway golf clubs, we're going to send you a set of Mizunos. Exactly, which by the way I think are wonderful clubs, but, but the point here Why? is... So do I. Yeah, but, but I use Zexios. And they don't cost as much. And so if they deliver the Zexio to me, when I've ordered the Callaway, I absolutely owe them the cost of the Zexio, but not the cost of the Callaway. But just trying to understand the contractual relationship here, the tuition agreement on its own doesn't tell us very much about what the universities are agreeing to do in exchange for the tuition payment. That is 100% true. That's exactly what our case is. So we, so the, if we only looked at the tuition agreement, it would be either unenforceable or it would be incomplete as a contract. Is that right? A hundred percent correct. That's exactly our argument. The, the Court of Appeals, though, said it's this simple. Register or services. If you register, if you register, and it, it, when I register for any class or receive any service, it, I'm then responsible for paying. 
And there's absolutely no description. Now, I can compare, there's a couple other cases we can look to that are very different, but I think worth pointing out. In Dean v. Chamberlain, which is a case in the Sixth Circuit, an Ohio case, in that case, there was actually a fulsome document. There was the, the enrollment agreement for, Ch for Chamberlain. That enrollment agreement explained exactly what was going to be provided and reserved some rights to the university to what they could change, what they could do. That didn't happen here. And there was, an, there was an integration clause there. That integration clause said that the enrollment agreement constitutes the entire agreement with respect to education services. But here, you have a promissory note that's got an, a, that happens to have an integration clause. Uh, Justice Viviano, you are 100% correct about what the issue is here. The issue here is there must be more contract than that simple little document. And by the way, I want to point out something else about the document. It is so one-sided that it's transparent. And I really only came to appreciate it when I saw a case. We haven't cited this case to the court because it was decided three weeks ago. It's Hickey versus University of Pennsylvania. It's from the Third Circuit. And it's, it's 2023 Westlaw 5734922. It's a September 6th case. But in that case, dealing with exactly the same, uh, they must share documents because it's exactly the same uh, uh, financial services agreement. And what they pointed out was these documents, every sentence begins I. It, if, you, if you read this, it, nothing is bilateral. The document says, I understand, I understand and agree, I understand and agree. It's, the students, when they sign these, and let's be clear about who signed these. They were either signed or clicked through online when they were trying to get to the registration. These are, in, for the most part, 18-year-old people who were never even legally able to enter into a contract until they, they turned 18. They've never seen anything like this, and they committed more than their entire life savings in most of these instances. And then the Court of Appeals says they're not going to interfere with the freedom of contract. What freedom of contract? They were handed a document. You get a choice. You go to school, you sign this. If you don't sign this, you don't get an education. That's the choice. And the Court of Appeals said, but then in hindsight, in hindsight, Mr. Horrigan for Eastern Michigan University has second thoughts about the contract. Seriously, who believes that these students sat down and negotiated an agreement with the university and under that agreement they said, we're gonna pay you thousands of dollars for the privilege of registering, and we're gonna get nothing else. Now other schools, in, in other courts- Or, have, or we're gonna get whatever it is you choose to provide. Or whatever you choose to provide, that's right. Whatever you choose to provide, which could be nothing, but might be a great education. Counsel, like, uh, assuming I agree with you that the, about your contractual argument. I hope you do. How do we, let's skip forward to the next step. How would we even begin to evaluate the, the value of what was provided? I mean, how do we, you know, you had, I think the majority of the semester for most of the schools, probably it was probably about the halfway point, and then everybody had to finish online. How do you value that? They, they were provided school, I understand, under less than perfect circumstances, um, but how, how would we as a body get involved on that? Well, to be candid, you wouldn't. A, a, a seven-member appellate court isn't going to hear this case on, on, at that level of factual detail. This is something that should have been tried in the Court of Claims, and it is a tough question, but it's not an impossible question. The issue is, what did the contract require the universities to do? And they're going to disagree with us. We say they were required to provide in-person education. They're going to say they weren't. But that's something to fight out. And then, what did we receive? What was it worth? And what it was worth, we had to pay for. We're not looking for a free lunch. Do you think it's possible just, to put a value on it? Like, absolutely, it's possible. I mean, because obviously it's different than the golf club example where I can subtract the value between the clubs and it's pretty concrete. This is, feels more intangible. It, it is intangible. And, and it, as the court knows, we ask courts to determine the value of a lost arm. We asked, we asked finders of fact to determine the, the impact on a person's reputation and what did that cost. This isn't anywhere near as difficult are, as that. Are you aware of universities um, <coughs> today, not, not 
not back at the time that, um, that, that there was the shift to online, serv uh, online classes. Are you have aware of universities that charge differently for um, in-person classes versus online courses or for, or for a hybrid? So some universities charge differently, less for the online and, and more for in-person. Some didn't. I think uh, Lake Superior State, I think, charged the same amount for both. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the difference between in-person planned education and the value of emergency remote teaching. And emergency remote teaching is not the same as a completely planned out program that's planned in advance for how it'll be sequenced and how it's presented online and how it's re received online. And by the way, some things, it's simply impossible. How do you really do a weightlifting class online? H how do you do uh, certain language classes? Yes. You could buy Babel, but that's not the same as, as a Professor Clement speaking to you directly in her native language. Wouldn't it, the, wouldn't it be a little bit dependent, too, on the individual plaintiff and what their learning capacity was? So, for example, uh, as we learned through COVID, young children did disastrously on online uh, learning because they're, they're, they like to move around. They don't like to sit in front of computer screens for long periods of time, so if one of your clients or, or one of these other plaintiffs had uh, either learning disabilities or attention deficit disorder, but then was forced to only do online learning for those people, uh, the value of that would be seemingly less. There always will be, and that's absolutely true. These are all putative class actions, and in every class action, it's very common to face the question that some people have different damages than others, and you have to work out a way to address the damages, to look at special factors one way or another. But some relief, you, you don't say people get no relief at all because we can't give them perfect relief. These students got no relief at all. The question is, what do you do to try, and, and yes, it's a tough issue. It'll be a tough case to try, but not an impossible case to try at all. Much tougher cases get tried than this. The, in the end, what we're dealing with, what we're dealing with is students, that there's a value. We'll have, ex by the way, we do have an expert, we, uh, Mr. Tatos, who you probably saw in, in some, of the, some of the writing. We're going to present an expert that's going to say what the value of the education was. They're going to present experts to say what the value of the education was. We're going to have facts about what the value of the education was. But the issue is whether you're talking about the room and board where they got, they were told to leave the dorms, literally told to leave the dorms. Were they required to? They weren't required to, but they were told that they were advised not to come back, especially if they left. They were asked not to come back. And the universities have provisions that say, that on an approved release, you don't have to pay. How can it not be an approved release when the school asked them to leave? And absolutely, there absolutely is a force majeure issue here. The schools could not provide and the students could not appreciate these benefits. Absolutely. There's a complete frustration of purpose here. We understand, we agree to that. And because of that frustration of purpose, each party is relieved of their obligation to some extent. To the extent the universities provided something, they should be compensated for it. But to the extent that they didn't, why are the students the guarantors of the universities? Is it, uh, is it right to think of the room and board agreement as part of the overall agreement that the student has with the university, or is that something separate? It, they really are separate agreements. I mean, it is in some respects it, it part and parcel of other things with the university. But there's an actual room and board agreement. It's a landlord-tenant agreement. It's written, and they've got the they've but got aren't the, they, the, the students the, required to uh, so, uh, either first year or in some cases first and second year to live on campus when they when you they know that's work. that's correct. Some are so arguably it's it's more. Maybe I shouldn't have been so quick to say it's not part, because in part it is. For, the, for some students, they had no choice. They had to live on campus. Well, but then on they the had other, to leave. the other side of it, the university doesn't allow just any old body to move into the dorms, do they? Don't you have to be enrolled in university right. classes? Right. You're, that's correct. They don't, and they reserve the right to tell people to leave because they're disruptive, because they present some health or safety hazard. And when that happens, sometimes those people still have to pay. That's not what happened here, of course. Here, the universities said, in keeping with the governor's orders, you have to leave. 
we don't want you here. I mean, they were respectful to the students. We have no complaint about no, what the university uh, did. One of your clients did leave and got a refund. Other people didn't leave. I'm, try, I, I'm trying to understand no, what your claim is in terms of room and board. Nobody got a 100% refund. Some people got partial refunds, but nobody got it. And it's interesting, in other schools in other parts of the country, it was very common that the schools gave full refunds prorated for the amount of the time. But it didn't happen here. With these particular just schools, so they clear, gave partial. Just so we're clear, that's your claim in this case? You, you, you're seeking a prorated refund? We're, we're seeking board? prorated, a full prorated refund for the time that the students with it, the, their purpose was frustrated at the time that they couldn't stay in those dormitories. And by the way, the meals, every one of the, the defendants points out that the meal says, you, you still have to pay for a meal you don't eat. Well, that's true. If my mother puts a meal down in front of me and I don't eat it, she's not, you know, I still gotta pay for it. I'm maybe not my mother, but, but, these meals weren't even provided. Why would they be? The campuses were ghost towns. There was no reason to provide the meals. Why did the schools get to keep the money? Now, some of the schools say, well, we gave you a partial refund or we gave you a credit next year. That would all be considered at the trial court. It would all be considered when you balance the rights of the parties, when you say, was there a contract? Was it breached? What were they supposed to do? And what did they actually do? What did they actually produce? You know, the students knew what they could expect. As Justice Viviano, Viviano said, you got course catalogs, you got the online advertising, you've got uh, and promotion, you've got counselors, you've got uh, the school recruiters, your parents, your siblings, your friends. History tells you what happens when you go to school, and the timer tells me when I should be quiet. <laughs> so, so with that, um, we, I, I will stop, except I, I, just to point out one other thing, which is the universities know how unconscionable this is. They clearly know it's unconscionable. And because of that, each one of the universities has pointed out what they did gratuitously, what they chose to do. And they even rewrite the contracts and say, well, it was registration and the receipt of services. That's not what the contract says, and it's not how it's enforced here. What the universities are saying is, trust us. Just trust us, we'll do the right thing and we've done the right thing. And you know what, maybe they did, but we have a right to go to court and say, what did you owe me, what did you give me, what do I owe you? And we don't think we got our money's worth. We're pretty certain we didn't. And that's what this is about. I'll reserve eight minutes and 57 seconds. Good morning, Your Honors. Paul Hudson on behalf of Eastern Michigan University. Uh, and Your Honors, the university defendants have agreed to uh, split our time evenly, so 10 minutes per university. Uh, Your Honors, I think it's important to uh, first make clear what this case is, is not about. Uh, this case is not about debating contentious policy issues uh, like uh, whether schools should have stayed open or even whether in-person learning is better than remote learning. This case is instead a very narrow legal issue, and the question is whether the plain language of the contract that the plaintiff had with the university guaranteed him exclusively in-person uh, classes throughout the semester. And on that question, uh, the contract is clear. Uh, there is no such promise anywhere in the contract. The plaintiff cannot and has not um, identified such a promise. And that's really what this case comes down to. The contract does not parse out how the university is required to provide educational services and does not mandate the university provide uh, in-person services, remote services, or a hybrid of the two. It instead leaves those decisions to the academic judgment of the university of how best to educate its students. Um, Taking advantage of the full free fire zone for all of your colleagues? I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that the court has, but I think the bottom, I interrupt, but. I think the bottom line is that the, the contract requires Eastern uh, to provide educational services. And Eastern on this record undisputedly did so. It provided over two months of in-person classes, over a month of remote classes. The plaintiff uh, received we're, full we're, course credit, so uh, we're stayed talking, on track for we're graduation. Talking about your client's Eastern, so we're talking about the tuition agreement? Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. And you said it requires that 
they uh, provide educational services. Is that, is that, are you reading that into where it says receive any service? Um, it's the second sentence there uh, that says the university is providing me educational services. Okay, so is it any educational services or is it, you know, the specific classes in the course catalog or is it any service, you know, any, any classes at all or, you know, it, in other words, the same question I asked the opposing counsel, isn't it tied into what the course catalog says your client offers? The, the contract, again, does not parse out what, how the university is to provide those educational services. But it has to be some, something. That, that, I mean, could it be like they provide preschool classes, level classes, and that would be sufficient in your view to, for them to, to uh, fulfill their obligations under the contract? Well, I, I think it's, it's important to, to tie things back to the facts of the case, right, where the university <laughs> provided over two months of in-person classes. Wait, 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 wait. Of, I'm just looking at the, the dry legal documents because you said it was a simple case and we just needed to look at the plain language of the contract. And I'm trying to discern from the contract, if I just look at the tuition agreement and don't consider registration in the course catalog, how do I know from the tuition agreement what it is your client is agreeing to provide? What services? Is it just literally any educational services? So if they decide we're going to do a, become a Montessori elementary school and you paid us and you even though you graduated from high school, now that's all you get. It wouldn't be a very good way to run a university, but... Um, it, it, the, it's a crazy contract, isn't it? You can literally provide any, anything you want. At any time, you could just say, you know what, we're halfway through the semester, and now you've, you've come here for engineer, engineering, but now all you can study is performing arts. So go get your leotards on and, and let's go. That's, that's, how the, that's what the contract provides? Well, I, I think there's a long tradition of, of providing universities academic autonomy. And yes, it is going to be up to the university. There's also a long tradition of universities providing in-person education in a campus environment for students, that's, which might inform what these young 18-year-olds thought they were going to obtain when they uh, matriculated and arrived on campus. And, and so then the question is, does this contract promise in-person uh, classes only? Um, it must promise something, right? It has to promise something or else it's not enforceable. It promises that the university will provide educational services uh, to any, its students. Uh, so any, any, fo any format. So if they decided um, we're just going to provide correspondence classes, so stay in your dorm and we'll mail you your, your quizzes and you can mail them back. That would fulfill its obligations? It, it does not parse out how the university is required to provide the educational services. It leaves that to the universities and the individual professors' uh, academic judgment about how to uh, educate its students. And it certainly doesn't ask courts so the to the sort of micromanage. The, the registration is also just a one-way ticket. <coughs> the students get to, it's basically they're expressing their preferences on what classes they want to take, but the university is in no way bound to provide those classes in exchange for the money it has accepted and received from the students. Isn't that a crazy position to take? I don't think there's anything crazy about this contract. Um, it is a standard university. But literally, uh, you think contract. they could change the course or terminate the course midway through the semester and still receive full tuition? So I, I, I think stepping back, um, there's one thing that contracts do is plan for the unexpected, right? If anything goes, if everything goes right, you barely even need a contract, right? So it allocates risks between the, the two contracting parties. Um, and so yes, for, for better or for worse here, uh, we don't require the part contracting parties to sort of list out every contingency what could possibly happen. And I'm not saying that Mr. Horrigan and the university contemplated that there was going to be a pandemic and it was going to disrupt the classroom. But the, the, the question is, okay, it happened, uh, and, and so what do we do under this contract? His claim is premised on a promise of in-person live instruction in a brick-and-mortar classroom. That promise, as both of the lower courts uh, concluded, does not appear in the written contract. And so we've heard a lot of talk First about- catalog in indicate whether the class will be in-person or online? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Does the course catalog indicate whether the class will be in person or online? The method of teaching? Does, isn't, there, isn't there classes in the 
traditional manner of, or method of teaching that will be located in room 100 and so forth. And then there's other classes that say, we'll provide these. We've planned this out and mapped it out in an online uh, method of teaching. Doesn't the course catalog make that clear to students, or is it just a crapshoot? You, you pick a class, and however it comes, it comes? Well, I, I think there's a registration process where you sign up for a class, and it, it likely identifies a, a, a classroom, yes, uh, so they know where to go, of course. Um, but the question is, okay, if something happens, right, if, I don't know, if there's a snow day for a week or if the professor's out of town, are we providing tuition refunds for, you know, for that one week of this semester, right? When, when things happen, how does this contract deal with that? And so we've heard a lot of but talk you, but, about it. But don't you contracts. select what you want out of the catalog? You say, well, I'll pay you the money. Here's what I want. I want th these are the things you're offering me. You know, you, you have these garden plants that I like or products, or, and I'm, I'm going to purchase those, and here's the money that I'm going to pay you for those. That, that's not how this works. I, I, I don't know what the limiting principle is, you, 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 and you don't seem to be providing any. So I, I could go there and want us to, to um, have, a, have a, a specialty or study a certain subject area or major or minor, and that's why I went to your university and you're saying they could terminate that, that, and not offer those classes, and you still have to pay the tuition? Does that does that really seem like that's what the, the your client wants to, everyone to know? I think we would be opening up a big can of worms if we said there was a viable cause of action when a a, a course changes a cl changes classrooms, right? Um, or, I'm not talking about changing classrooms. What's the limiting principle? When, when can they? If you sign a tuition agreement because you want to take certain classes and the university can it, I think, is what you're telling us at any time they can stop providing not, not just the format, it would have to extend to the type of class, I think. As long as they provide some university or educational services, your position would be they've fulfilled their obligation. I think that's what you're telling us. Please tell me if I'm wrong. My position, the university's position is, again, that the university's academic judgment governs how to provide the educational services. I think we need to bring the, the argument back to sort of reality of what happened here. And we're not talking, I'll but, concede but, but there wait, are edge we cases. Get, before we get to the facts, their academic judgment, I, I agree they have a lot of academic freedom to decide how to provide an education and to decide what classes to provide. But doesn't that end when they pr provide a course catalog to induce students, which they then market? to induce students to enroll in their university, or does their academic freedom continue after a binding agreement is formed by which they're receiving payment in exchange for the very specific services they've advertised in their course catalog, or just continues on? That allows them to... I think what you're suggesting is that there is some sort of implied contract out there uh, I'm not even sure that it's implied. Corners. I think your tuition agreement is, is dependent on registering for class. And registering for class is done in reference to a course catalog that, that specifies what educational services the university is providing for the very time period, semester, that the, the student is being asked to pay tuition. But there's no promise in the contract that uh, those courses must be held in that specific classroom and with that specific professor things go wrong and so you're you've, you're at your 10 minute mark i just want to follow up because um, i think what justice viviano is is getting at can, can the university put everything out there and everything's in, per, in person everyone registers for classes and then the day before classes begin the university can say you know what we want to be an online university we're going to switch everything over to online we're going to send out a blast email here's how you log in can the university do that I don't want to, I won't fight the hypothetical, I'll answer it. Um, it's a, a good reminder, though, that that's nothing close to what happened here, right? I'm not talking about what happened here. Yep. I'm asking what, what, are you, what are you stating that the university has... It could happen here if we rule the way you're asking us. That's the point, I think. The, the, the university uh, was required to provide educational services under the contract. Um, tuition was due, uh, you know, as at the point of registration and beyond that this to this agreement does not uh, have a requirement about specifically how the university so to answer my hypothetical 
does to the answer university, your hypothetical, does the university have the authority left, to do what, what I just outlined? It would be left to the university's academic judgment about how to deliver those educational services. And if, and if the university made a, a judgment about um, this is the best way uh, to educate our students, then, then yes, the, the contract gives the university uh, that judgment. Thank you, Your Honors. Hi, Gary Falk on behalf of Lake Superior State University. Uh, I want to start by reiterating that we have a clear contract here. I understand your questions to Mr. Hudson, but we do have a clear contract that to register or provide educational services um, results in an agreement to pay for the services. Um, there's an integration clause which takes care of any argument that some sort of expectation based on what's in a university catalog can be integrated into this agreement or needs to be supplementing what's in this agreement. Basically, what Mr. Fink is arguing is that the integration clause should just be ignored, which I think would cause chaos uh, under well, the integration laws. clause doesn't make the contract complete if all of its terms aren't, don't appear on its face, does it? No, but I think that the contract is complete, that what it's saying client, that we're going to provide your, a... Same questions I asked you the last, uh, Mr. Hudson. What did your client agree to, to provide in exchange for tuition? Educational services. So, so same question, could, could, they, could they provide preschool level classes? That, that's educational, I, I, right? You know, I think that that's kind of a hypothetical here. I think we all know we're talking about university oh, level. You're, you're, the the mm -hmm. rule in this case, if we were to write an opinion, will set forth the latitude that your client, their academic freedom, how much latitude they have going forward. And if there's no limiting principle to your position, then I don't see why they couldn't provide preschool classes or kindergarten classes or why they couldn't make all kinds of changes at the last minute, like Justice Clement said, to fully uh, online, why they couldn't change to correspondence classes. What's the limiting principle? What am I missing? Limiting, I, think, I think the limiting principle is that the universities have academic freedom to provide university level programming. Uh, you, I mean, we're simplistically thinking about a ca course catalog. It's in person with professor, uh, Viviano on this date and this time and that somehow that's some implication that everything's going to be done in that classroom. Universities do this all the time. No, there, that there are online assignments, there are online lectures, there are in-person classes in today's day and age using university uh, academic freedom and professor academic freedom are presented in a hybrid fashion even when they're in person. But isn't it optional with the students? Don't they get to choose? Or does your uh, university set forth that we? it's on our sole discretion to decide the format of your class at any time, even after you've chosen? So, if I, so for example, say I want an in-person education. Should I just never go to Lake State because they can do whatever they want at any time and make it all online or correspondence? So I would not go there for that reason if I was a person who valued an in-person education in an on-campus environment, right? Is that, is that the message that you guys I, are sending I, to, to prospective students? I don't think students? that Lake State or any other university does that. I mean, they, we're talking about a very I unique circumstance I don't think they do that either. Here. They'd be crazy to do that. They'd but be, you all are here saying they have the right to do that under the contract. We I don't think they do that. Just so we're clear, I have respect for all yeah. these universities and the way they conduct themselves. And for 100 years, they've conducted themselves a certain way. And I also think they did their best, uh, made their best choices that they could. I don't agree with all of them, but they made the best choices they could in how to deal with the pandemic. And I, I don't think that's really the issue here. And I don't even think it's the issue, as your opposing counsel suggested, that there's some value to even the emergency online uh, classes that they offer. Those aren't without, without value. The question is, very simply, does your client agree to do anything specific in exchange for tuition, or do they really have the amount of latitude that, that you're, 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 you're suggesting? 
I think that the contract is clear. I think they have the authority to schedule and present academic content. Of any kind, like any subject matter? Like the student says, I want to be a, an engineer, and you say, sorry, you're going to be a teacher. I mean, this is kind of like a communist thing, right? Or <laughs> yeah, I, I can only tell you what is in the contract that what happened here, I, I think that that is a, Horse you know, it's, a good, it's a good question, but I think it's kind of far out of the realm of what we're saying here. The course and catalog doesn't bind your client at all. The selection I don't think makes. the course catalog binds you to present in a certain method. Um, does, it, does it bind you to the subject matter at least? Well, let's talk about Ms. Zweiker, who's the plaintiff in our case. She got the courses. She got the educational uh, instruction. She completed it. She got the course credit. Mr. Fink is arguing that's somehow of lesser value. And I think in one of the briefs he had mentioned that, you know, there's a difference in what the value is the university collects on in-person and on online courses. Well, at Lake State, there's not. It's, it's, one, it's one rate, and in fact, which we, it's $100 per class extra charge for online, which of course we didn't charge. But, you know, the idea that she didn't get what she bargained for, I don't think is there. I don't think there's any damages. I don't think there's a claim that she did not get the educational content that she bargained for. What about with housing and food? What was that? What about with, with housing and food? The housing and food? Well, in this, case, yeah, in this case, Lake <clears throat> Superior State did not extract people from the dorms. Some universities did, we didn't. They were perfectly uh, able to stay there. A lot of students did, a lot of students didn't. The contract is very clear that if you leave to go to another residence, you don't get a refund of tuition. You don't get a refund of meals. She could have come back. Now, the, if, no, I, no, no. Just for clarification, if, if a student left, they could come back? They could come back, okay. absolutely. Um, the, the president did say, hey, the governor has ordered people to stay in place, um, so we're asking you, if you do to choose to leave, not to come back, they didn't prohibit it. If somebody wanted to come back, they'd provi uh, provide access and, and the meals that they were, that isn't they contracted it, for it, and they paid for. Isn't it a little inconsistent? I know we had the best scientific minds supposedly working on this pandemic, but for the university to say that it's unsafe to congregate in a classroom, but you have to congregate in the dorm and stay living there, and then you have to congregate when you eat your meals? Well, the university didn't say it's unsafe to be in a classroom. That's what the governor of the state of Michigan put in an executive order and prohibited it. So what choice do the universities have? They could have canceled the whole, sele whole semester. They only do and it, then I think there would have been a good argument. They only do it during the period of time when the governor's uh, order was to not be in person? Did it end as soon as the governor? Yeah, I, it, was like, it was like a month between then and the end of, and the, end of the, the semester. Um, I, I think this opens a slippery slope too. As Mr. Po uh, Hudson alluded to, what about uh, if a horrific? I'm sorry to interrupt because I see you're going down a different. Oh, path. I'm running yeah, into Mr. Uh, yeah. Mr. Kaufman's uh, time, so thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Your Honors. Uh, I'm up here. Uh, Ryan Kaufman, Name Police Court, on behalf of Central Michigan University. And, and your honors, we've talked a lot about the financial agreement and financial responsibility statement that, that the universities uh, have, have talked about. But I'd like to point out a couple of things that are a little bit different with the CMU case. Because when CMU first moved for summary disposition, we had the same argument that this is a C8 motion. We moved for dismissal of all counts. We pointed to the financial responsibility. I'm having a hard time I understanding you. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Might Maybe I'm, I'm, I stepped away from the mic. Might want to lift it up. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, we made the same argument, and our trial court judge, Judge Murray, um, in lieu of granting that order, directed 
plaintiff to provide all documents that supported their theory that an implied or an express contract existed. And in response, plaintiff submitted a number of documents, and then the court examined those and determined that they did not create a contract, either express or implied, that the plaintiff was alleging existed. And the contract the plaintiff is alleging existed is that CMU would provide in-person classes and wouldn't deviate from that um, modality, even if unprecedented circumstances required that. So even if unprecedented circumstances, such as this pandemic, required the university to move away from that method of teaching, the university's no, so academic just, freedom would not allow to do so. I have a question that just kind of goes to the whole sure. essence of this. And, and the argument has been excellent by everybody, been outstanding. But the, the question I just have, and I think that really goes to the heart of it is, we all understand that this was an episodic event. We all understand that this was monumentous. We all understand that this was historical. But what it feels like is that everything's getting passed down to the students. And I think that's really the question that, you know, <coughs> it's a general question. But that's the question I really would love to have somebody answer, right? It's all going to go downhill, right? It's going to go from the governor to the university. But why is it, at the end of the day, that, it's the, the, that ultimately the ultimate sacrifice in this, the ultimate hardship in this, the ultimate expense of this has to be borne solely and exclusively by young people <coughs> and students. That, that's the essence, right? The essence of this entire thing. <coughs> no one's arguing it wasn't a horrible pandemic. Nobody's arguing, you know, that, that you know, everybody was, you know, there was a, a stream. Nobody was arguing that there were orders that were given. Nobody was arguing that everybody did the best they could. I don't think that's the argument. But really what I, I think in terms of the, the lesson of fairness as it pertains to this entire situation is why does it have to be exclusively, exclusively born by students and young people who are working to get through school? Sure, Your Honor. And, and Especially at your school. Sure, the I appreciate the question. And, and, and I, I would, I guess, argue that <coughs> the burden was not placed on the students. The students still received a quality education, the best education that anybody could receive in the face of a pandemic. And they did receive uh, full, full in-person classes before the uh, governor's orders, uh, in, you know, required the transition to online teaching, and then they received the remote teaching, the best teaching that they could receive after that point. They continued to receive educational services that, through the academic judgment of the professors, allowed them to receive. They, they received full credit. They received the ability to decide whether they wanted to take the class as a pass-fail or to take the grade after they received the grade. So, so there were a number of accommodations made to the students that recognizes the hardship of being a student why does during the, student, the pandemic. Why does the, student, why does the student go to your school? Um, students go to CMU for, for, for a quality education, and that's what they received even they during the pandemic. They go to school, pandemic. but just for the education, or do they go for other things? Sure. And, if I were to go to Central, wouldn't, am I going just for that, or am I, going, am I paying for other activities? Am I paying for other things? Your Honor, to the extent there's any kind of contractual relationship, an implied contractual relationship for anything, the, the plaintiff had the ability to come forward with those documents. Discovery was open in my case for seven months, and we never received a single interrogatory, a single request for production, a single deposition. This case did not fail for want of discovery. This case fails I'm understanding, because there's but no documents. Why wouldn't I go? But I guess my question is aren't I going for the, the sports? I'm going for the athletics. I'm going for the campus. I'm going for the camaraderie. I'm going to be with other students. I'm going to have that in-person experience. I'm going for college, right? What, what each student goes to CMU for is, is a case-by-case -case student, or case-by-case -case decision, and any student who went to CMU for all those reasons and, and can point to any document that shows that that was part of their implied, in fact, contract is certainly free to, to come forward with those documents and show, hey, I looked at this marketing material, I looked at this course catalog, I looked at anything, and this is the impression that I received. But when plaintiff, in this case, plaintiff Dalkey, was given that opportunity, they had nothing to offer. And when they were given seven months to engage in discovery on the unjust enrichment claims, they still had nothing to offer. And at the close of the discovery, when they filed a motion to amend the complaint to restate the implied question. So, people, so, 
So people go to CMU for different reasons, but you're not willing to contend that people are going for an experience that gives them the college experience, right? A absolutely, no, absolutely. Students go to CMU because it's Mount Pleasant, it's a lovely campus, they go to football games. And a, any student at CMU gets to do this. A typical student would be at CMU for eight semesters. In seven semesters, they get to go to football games, they get to go to baseball games, hockey games, they get to hang out with their friends in the dorms. It was this one semester for two weeks where none of us got to do what we wanted. We all had to work at home. We all had our lives impacted. And the, what the university did in terms of tuition was to deliver the best education that they possibly could using their own academic judgment and continue to provide the educational services for the exact classes that they signed up for, uh, uh, Justice Viviano. For, 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 for the- It only it, lasted two weeks? They, they, I'm sorry? It only lasted two weeks? Well, the, the six weeks, of, of the semester that between March and early May when the semester ended. It, you know, the, that transition. If I'm a student that has attention deficit disorder and I can't learn online, what value did I get from What if from you're that? a student who's blind and can't learn? And, and a student by student case, if, if any student uh, had as part of something that they read that it made part of their implied contract, that student could have been the plaintiff. That student could have been the lead plaintiff in this case and could have pro provided the documents that showed that an implied contract existed. I, are, are we just going to say an implied contract exists for all I'm not on students? A, I'm, 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 I'm not necessarily on an implied contract. I, 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 I guess maybe you should address why, why isn't the course catalog, uh, the question I've been asking your colleagues, part of the agreement between the parties. I, I agree to pay tuition in exchange for registering for classes. And, and, that, and that implies that registration is important to the tuition agreement, which also then implies that what you're registering for is part of the agreement. Why, why, why am I wrong? If, if the CAS, if, I'll accept your premise. I'll accept that the CAS course catalog becomes part of the uh, contract, but, but, but then it's the course, what does the course catalog say? And, and is there ever any deviations from the course catalog from the time when students sign up to the time of delivery of but, classes? But you know, the question then before. becomes whether there are reasonable deviations and how they impact certain students. You know, it's, it's going back to our golf, golf uh, catalog example. You know, if they sent me the same brand of clubs, but they sent me left-handed clubs, and they said, well, these are just as good. We charge the same amount for them. They're just as valuable to us. And you'd say, well, I, I can't use them. They don't, they don't help me. I'm not the type of person who can learn on a computer screen. So, you know, it, it seems to me even, even providing credit doesn't answer the question, I don't think, because I don't think the university guarantees that they're going to provide credit because you might fail the course. But what, they get, what they're agreeing to provide is the opportunity to learn in the subject matter that you're interested in learning. Isn't that, in essence, what every university is offering and provides their students? But that's not the plaintiff who brought this case against Central Michigan University. The plaintiff Dalkey did, and when given the opportunity to come forward with any of those proofs, to come forward with an affidavit, to have seven months of discovery to develop this claim, she came forward with none of that. I, I have if a question. If there was a student what, oh. that was in Justice Viviano or Justice Bernstein's um, example you know, situation, someone that had a learning disability, someone that was blind, and they went to the university and said, you're shifting to online learning, I cannot do this. How would the university have handled that? The uni I, I don't know. I, I, I suspect Had that not a single student that, that was in a position where they said, I can't do this? I believe in that situation, a plaintiff very well, that plaintiff very well could have an argument that, hey, I should have gotten my tuition back, but I wouldn't have gotten those credits. They would have given them the full tuition. They would have taken that whole semester off. That's not Plaintiff Delkey. Plaintiff Delkey completed her semester and got every single credit she signed up for for every single class she signed up for. And when given the opportunity to explain that she was one of these special people that couldn't but transition, is it the credit she or did the not. the opportunity to learn the subject matter that you're offering? She, she did have that opportunity to learn the subject matter, and she took advantage of it, and she got the credits, and, she, and she's kept the credits. And, and I'm sure by now she's graduated from the university because this was four years ago, three years ago. I guess ago. my question, Colin, you're doing a great job because I know you've got people kind of funneling me here, but you're doing an excellent job. I guess my question to you is why are universities different from anybody else that was impacted by this pandemic? For example, if people had weddings, if people had office parties, if, if people were buying plane tickets, everyone else got refunds, why are you different? 
I just, I, I, I don't quite understand how the university is different from the caterer of if, if a person was supposed to get married and they had a contract with the caterer and the caterer is like, well, listen, we have a governmental order. We can't, we, we can't do it the way you want to do it. You know, the person isn't going to pay. If I, if I buy a ticket on Delta and they don't transport me to where I have to go, no matter what the reason is, weather or, or let's just say it's just some horrible, you know, at the end of the day, in every other area, the, 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 the business was basically the one that had to um, usurp the, the, the challenge or, the, or the, the, the cost. Why are you different? Why is it that there's a, there's a difference between you and the caterer, the airline, everyone else that was impacted dramatically by the pandemic, but universities are not the same. Why is that? It, educational services in light of the academic freedom that universities possess are different than any other service that you can, you can get. It's not, it's not a catering service, it's not a meal, it's not a meal in a restaurant, it's not going to a concert, and it's not flying on an airplane. Every it's a time service. you go to a You're college, still giving me a service. Well, but it's a, it's, it's a very unique service, right? I mean, one professor might teach Geography 101 quite differently than, than, than his colleague in a different department. And that's academic freedom. And, and, and that's what universities do. They, they, they bring the ability for faculty members to decide what they're going to teach, who they're going to teach, how the method of instruction is going to be delivered to the students. These are the things that, that make this service so much more unique than, than the other services. And you just any mentioned. other service in the world? Like, not any other service in the world, but considerably different than catering services or flying on an airplane real estate or eating or at a restaurant. Every, I, I, my whole point of this is, and I think this is a little bit of my, my concern or a little bit of my frustration is, everybody was affected and everybody had to bear costs as a result of it, except for you. And that's the question I have to you is that, are you so unique and so special in what you do that you are exempt, different from everybody else who had to bear some costs. And I think what the plaintiffs are simply arguing here is they're not even saying all the costs. They're just simply saying some costs. And your position is, no, we're so much better than that that we aren't going to do anything because we're a university and that's just how we flow or how we roll. The, the, the universities did, to be clear, experience significant hardship and costs, just like everybody else. I mean, it, 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 they had, um, you know, employees going to, you know, working from home. They had to make those transitions. They, they had to, they had to move on the fly. They had facility issues. I mean, everybody, everybody suffered, and the universities were not exempt. It's of just, course, no, no, I, I appreciate did they it. It's, it's not. Contract. It's not the answer of this. Comparing it to the Delta Airlines. I've got a flight from here to Los Angeles and it's canceled because of, of concerns over weather or something that's going on. So instead, Delta takes me, not directly to Los Angeles, but I have to go to Chicago. From Chicago, I have to go to Dallas. From Dallas, I get to go to uh, Orange County Airport and then they take a bus and take me to LAX. I still got there. Isn't that what's happening here? It's not exactly what they thought they were going to get, but at the end of the day, you delivered an education. Isn't that the answer? I think that is the answer, uh, Your Honor. And, and, and they did deliver an education, and, the, and they did get credits, and all the students got full, full credit, and they moved one semester closer to graduation. How about if we hear from Mr. Fink? Thank you. Mr. Fink, when Mr. Hudson said something about an implied contract in response to a question from Justice Viviano, I saw you shaking your head. Is your theory implied contract or is it express contract? Because I'm getting the sense from questioning from Justice Viviano, he likes express, but you were shaking your head yes to implied. I read your brief to say implied. What is it that you're alleging? Yes, we think there is an implied contract. The contracts they're talking about, the, these financial agreements, they're not contracts at all because there's no consideration. There's nothing required of the university. So they're void. They're unenforceable. That's the contract they're talking about. By the way, we had a fascinating Is there admission. nothing? I mean, the university can't provide zero. That, that's, that's, that's what the, the financial services agreement says. The financial services agreement says if you register, we're done. Once and we, we have register, to provide you nothing. Yes, because you it register, says, you pay the money, and then we say we're not going to we're not going to 
hold a single class. Right. The central Michigan document says upon registration, you owe all the money. The other two documents say upon registration or the provision of service, not and, or. They've written in their briefs that it's and, but it's not and. It says or in the contracts. But was, These were are not your real clients contracts. or any other person that you're identified provided zero educational services? We don't have that here. No, no, right? nobody got zero educational services because okay. they were getting educational services right up to the point. So the fact that the that document could be read to say that is is that. I mean, I get it. Like this is a hard line drawing, right? Slippery slope, right? I, I could say, I I want to go to CMU for the experience, the educational experience, and I love football games. But lo and behold, they blow this big cannon every time there's a touchdown scored, and that is destroying my appreciation and enjoyment of the football game and I'm going to sue Central Michigan because I didn't get the services that they provided that they agreed to provide me is that would that be possible I, I don't think so that, that's an extraordinary why? because that's an extraordinary one-off that we're talking about and in that situation the student probably would want to withdraw and if and the a, student withdraws and the pandemic it, is not an extraordinary one-off it absolutely is an extraordinary circumstance but we, what we go back to and this is all this is all about contract we just heard an argument in which one of the lawyers said that this is about assigning risk, and the risk was all assigned to the students, but that's not what the contracts say. The, again, to be clear, we don't think these financial services agreements really are fully integrated contracts for the whole relationship, and, and I would call your attention to the Hickey case that reasons this better, frankly, than we did in our brief, but the issue is in the, all they agreed to was, <clears throat> and, and this is how, by the way, the panel, the, the Court of Appeals, they said they don't have to look at the ambiguity in the term services because it became irrelevant when somebody registers. Registration is all that's necessary to make you fully responsible. We don't think that's true. We think that all of these hy hypotheticals we've heard are valid. And by the way, Justice Kavanaugh, in a situation, yes, for a few, a few weeks, they got services in this semester, and then, a cannon did go off, and they were told from here on, it's only emergency remote teaching. That doesn't work for somebody who's blind. We've heard that already. That doesn't work for somebody who, for any reason, can't work and be educated through a computer. And what to about, be clear. What about opposing counsel's argument that maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but you had seven months to show, to, to establish facts that would show that it didn't, in fact, work for that no, person, but, and, and it wasn't there? But to be clear, that, that's the Central Michigan case. Eastern Michigan, LSSU were both dismissed on C8 motions. There was no presentation. The facts that we were to present to the court were not after seven months of discovery. It was before discovery began when the motion was being argued and the court said, give us what you've got. And the truth is what we have is exactly what Justice Viviano talked about, exactly what we've been hearing about today. Course catalog, online information about what you'd get. What, it, we know what the common understanding was. For a hundred years, we've known what's happened in universities. And that gets right to what Justice Viviano was talking about. That's the implied contract. There was an implied contract. There is an implied contract when you go to school that you're going to get something. And that's made up of a lot of different things. You know, if, if we had a situation um, where the course started and it's in person and then something happened with the professor, um, and the professor was in, you know, in the hospital, and they had to have another professor sub, but, but in order to do that, they had to like, like double up, right? And so they, they went to online for two weeks. Are the students entitled to a, you know, prorated reimbursement for that? I, I don't really think so. I think you're talking, we're talking about a couple of extremes here. And by the way, I want to say, we're talking all about the tuition issue. There's still another issue, and it's an important one, very responsive to something that Justice Bernstein was asking about. And that is, when counsel said, we are not a catering company, well, actually they are. The universities provide meals and didn't give a full refund for them. The universities are landlords and expected to still keep the rent after they told people to leave. And it's not true that LSSU didn't tell students to leave. If students left campus, 
They turned off their electronic access. They could request permission to get it back, but it's symbolic of the fact that the school said, don't come back. We don't have a problem with them saying, don't come back. We have a problem with them saying, don't come back and we're still gonna charge you as though we were giving you a place to live because they we're say not you're giving you a place to you're required to leave and you're not gonna get a reimbursement? I'm sorry, what? Did they say you're required to leave campus? You cannot stay here and you're not getting a reimbursement. They, the different schools use different terms. They encouraged, they urged. At, at initially, LSSU said if you leave, you can't come back, but you can stay. And you know, it's a more distant location and it's understandable if that they, they would do said, that. If they had said, it's up to you, we are not closing campus, uh, we strongly urge you to do so. If you do, you are not gonna get a, a prorated reimbursement. They didn't really speak to that and if nobody they, asked. If they did. And a, and a student decided to leave? If they said, well, I, be, I don't know that they had the right, and this just comes back to the original issue that we heard today, when one of the attorneys said, there's an allocation of risk, that's what happens in contracts, but in this case, there is no such allocation of risk, so there's an ambiguity. And why is the ambiguity <coughs> being interpreted in favor of the drafter. The university wrote all these documents. If there's an ambiguity about who has to pay, who bears the price, clearly that should be resolved against the drafter, not in the drafter's favor. So the question, if the university announced, we're no longer gonna teach you and you can't have any credit. It, no longer teach you in person. Right. Well, that is what they said. I want to point out something else that's really fascinating. We've heard now on, from multiple counsel and in the briefs, the students got credit, so what are they complaining about? If I were to say in a public statement, the value of a university of, uh, an Eastern Michigan University degree the, of education is the credit, not what they teach me. I don't think or they the said that it's just the credit. They said they got an education they got the services, different than how it was understood or, or hoped to be, and they got the credit. I don't think they, I don't, I don't know that that's a fair characterization of what they said. Well, maybe it's not, and I apologize if it's not. I did hear them say repeatedly that this was a value, that the credit was a value. And I don't think most universities would be proud to say that you paid, you got a credit, what more do you want? And, and what happened it has here- It something to do with whether the credit is earned or whether it was yes. freely given. That's, that's true, that's absolutely true. It happens sometimes, it, I'm not saying it happened yeah. here, but it's I mean, certainly it, possible. Yeah. If the credit is an indication that somebody got a fine education and, and, and that they learned what they came for, okay, that's a different thing, but we don't think the credit is the answer. I would say this, that um, the, if, to, I wanna be clear about this, we are not arguing that these documents, that these promissory notes, which is really all they are, that these promissory notes are the contracts that bound the students in all respects. We're not making that argument. Apparently, I'm about to make a different argument. <laughs> you have four seconds to do But so. counsel, I'm gonna, really ask a, I'm gonna ask a the, question. The that issue, will, okay, I'm sorry. I'm gonna ask a question that's gonna give you some more time. Um, I, I just wanna go back to Justice Zara's comment where we were using that analogy and we were using the analogy about the airline industry and the airline analogy, and he said, well, what if I went to Chicago and I went to Denver and I took a bus and I did all that kind of stuff? Standard practice in that would be that you would be compensated, that there would be some type of compensation. So looking at the analogy that Justice Zara used with the airline industry, basically he said, we got them there. Like, we got the, and then he said that ultimately it's the same thing here, they got their education. Isn't the real issue here that in that analogy, there would be some compensation because of the inconvenience. There would be some compensation because the value is not the same. Isn't it the same argument here in the sense of the, the level of service, the level of education, and the level of experience was not the same? The, no matter exactly, whose fault exactly. it is, was, isn't look, that the argument? It, like exactly. Regulation. If, yeah. if we look at this from the perspective of the university, they're just saying, what did we deliver? We had to fly you to all these different places and got you there. But Justice Bernstein, you're correct. That's the exact issue. The issue is not what did the university do. The issue is what value did the student get? We negotiated 
we're going to say negotiated, we entered into an agreement, and that agreement provided we were going to pay, we were going to get a certain kind of education, which is described in the course catalog. And today, we've got at least one admission that the court ca course catalog should be part of the implied contract, of, of the entire contract. Well, fine, that's a great idea, but that's not what the Court of Appeals said. The Court of Appeals said there, those course catalogs have nothing to do with your judgment. I'd add this, and it's really important. When we're talking about the value that we get, the value, you've got one, the education, two, the meals that they still had to pay for, three, the dormitories that they couldn't live in. What value did they get? And that's what would happen in a private in context. And look it, they got millions of dollars from the CARES Act because they did suffer. They got that money, the students didn't. And the students keep being the ones that bear the burden, even though not a single contract says that. There's no document that says the students should be bearing the burden. Thank you. The case will be submitted. Thank you all. Oh, and, and I do want to, I, I really do appreciate, I, I should have said this, I know we all want to say, really appreciate this new process with the applications for leave to appeal. It really <laughs> means a lot to all of us to have the opportunity to argue them. Thank you very much. We will stand recess until one o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>